what that epiphany was. Well, I got hosed by Brian's movie, Apollo 13. <laughs> so I rented that movie from Blockbuster a long time ago, and uh, I forgot to return it. Wow, okay, I didn't know that was a catalyst. There we go. <laughs> uh, and it, it was a $40 late fee. And I remember it because I was so embarrassed about it, I didn't want to tell my wife. <laughs> and uh, about a year later, my then company, I was running a tech company, got acquired. I was looking for something to do. And that was just one of those incidences that stuck with me of, you know, there's clearly got to be a better way. Yeah. Uh, and so that was the genesis of Netflix. And when we started, we knew, look, uh, DVDs, you know, a great digital packet, you know, it's got five gigabytes on it and you can mail it overnight. But eventually the internet would be fast enough to uh, stream. Uh, and it took a lot longer than we thought. Our business plan in 97 said, uh, in five years, half our business will be streaming. And we got to 2002, and it was 0% of our business. And we said, well, in five years, uh, that was when we went public in 2002. We said, in five years, half our business will be streaming. And we got to 2007, and 0% <laughs> of our business was streaming. Uh, but then the third time we made the prediction, it more than came true. We said, five years, half our business will be streaming. And by 2012, it was 80%. Wow. Um, so it just shows you if you have something dumb and you say it long enough, it becomes smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're on, uh, you know, if you think of your industry, it was very stable for 200 years. Um, and the right thing to do for most of the both paper magazine, paper newspaper industry was just do a little bit better reporting, a little bit better mm -hmm. ad sales, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the basic things were very stable. Um, and then uh, there's now this huge change in sure. your business for the internet. Um, that was true for us in the DVD days. In DVD days, I woke up and those kind of, wow. This, this but so you feel very secure and hunky-dory now? Now it's execution. It's how do we have, you know, the basic idea of uh, you all give us your money. Thank you for that. And then it's up to us to turn that money into joy. And we have to do that better and better. And if we create shows that you love, you'll continue to pay us. And so we get up and think every day that we got billions of dollars that the customers are giving us, and we have to turn that into joy. Uh, and that's this movie and that show, and, and, and that's hard work, right? But that's our focus is to do that better and better. This company is, is a triumph or, or helpful. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, um, uh, my first company was a tech software company. Uh, started in 1990, it got acquired in 1997. Uh, and it grew very quickly, um, but very chaotically. And I always felt like I was half underwater. I was not doing a very good job as a manager. The products were really good, so the sales increased. But as a leader and manager, not very effective. What were and you doing wrong? I wasn't very honest. Um, I was uncomfortable about being honest with people, so I, I valued kindness very high and consideration, and there's, that's a good value too, but ten, you know, uh, honesty is really important at work. So I'd be frustrated with you, and I wouldn't really tell you, mm -hmm. uh, but it would, of course, manifest itself, um, and it took me a long time to have the courage both to be able to be an example of honesty myself, uh, to receive it, to give it, to give it. And ultimately, of course, it, you know, obviously for all of you, you're probably sitting there thinking, of course, you know, how, why was that so hard? Uh, and I, I think part of the reason was I had never led anything when I started the company. As you were kind of coming up, who were your personal heroes? Well, interestingly, in the, you mentioned the startup coherent thought that I worked at um, when I was 28, and I worked so hard as an engineer writing code, you know, I was there every night, all night kind of thing, how hard can you push? And, uh, you know, I would build up over time on my desk this kind of gross set of coffee cups, um, and then, uh, you know, now and then the janitor would clean them all. And I learned that if I just waited long enough, I didn't have to clean them. You know, the janitor would do them. <laughs> uh, and one morning I, I came in really early to work, you know, five in the morning. Uh, and I walk into the bathroom and there were all my cups um, being cleaned. And I looked up and it was our CEO, uh, Barry Plotkin, who was cleaning them. And so, you know, it's early in the morning. I'm like, I'm trying to understand the situation because I see him there scrubbing away. So finally, I just asked him, I was like, Barry, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm cleaning your cups. And I was like, have you been doing it the whole years? Yeah. And I'm like, and you never said anything? No. Why? And he said, well, you work so hard, and this is the only thing I can do for you. Wow. And I just thought, well, I will follow this guy to the end of the earth.
And that's exactly where he led us. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened is he was an incredibly charismatic guy that didn't have a good market product fit vision. And we built an incredibly elaborate product and we ultimately sold one copy of it to one customer and they never installed it. So, you know, it's like, it's a funny thing about leadership. You can be very personally compelling and high integrity, that's great, but you also got to lead people in the right direction, not into the Box Canyon. I think they're boss, because they don't really know what they're supposed to be doing anyway. The goal is to get people to think about what's best for the company. How do we grow? How do we please our members ever more? And we want people to be independent thinkers. We don't want them to ever hide anything from their manager but we want them to be thinking about <clears throat> how can we do things better? And that f first principle thinking is what's helped Netflix evolve through so many changes. Most of our industrial culture is not really focused on creativity, it's focused on error prevention. And that's good if you're an airline or a hospital, okay? But if you're a creative organization, what you wanna do <clears throat> is make it safe for people to make mistakes and to try things sort of managing on the edge of chaos, where you're, you're very creative, but it hasn't mm. actually tipped into chaos. You know, we model ourselves on professional sports, where you want the team to really work well together and to play their heart out. I mean, athletes know that they can be injured at any moment, but they don't focus on it. They focus on how do they play the best game that they can. And our employees are similar. They focus on how do they have an incredible professional experience, learn a lot, um, grow an incredible amount, and change the company for the better. Attracting genuinely brilliant creative people and empowering them. Yeah, it's definitely not the data. Um, so there's lots of data about what television shows people watch from Nielsen. There's lots of data of box office for film. So all of our competitors have, have lots of data too. That's not... The difference is we have lots of people in our content group that can make decisions. In a major studio or network, every decision gets uh, reviewed five levels up and you know micromanaged. And what we do is we have lots of independent people who are then making decisions, big decisions, uh, about co what content to do and why. And some of them won't work out, okay? Some of them will be a mistake, but that's okay. And because if you get, you know, Orange is the New Black and you get Stranger Things and you get the Old Guard, you get, you know, these big successes. So um, it's really organized around distributing power. I talk about how a perfect quarter for me is one where I've made no decisions. All I've done is advocate, influence, inspire. Um, and, you know, I do have to make some decisions like uh, promoting Ted to COO, uh, Ted Sarandos, um, who's been with us for more than 20 years. So again, I do make some, but they're as few as possible because what we wanted to do is to really have the other people make the decisions. And um, again, th that's worked extremely well in content because then we can attract very talented people out of CBS, um, out of HBO, because they get to make decisions and they get to run independently. The underdog anymore, how do you try and keep innovative? Oh, we are uh, so much the underdog. So uh, our uh, content budget uh, is about $3 billion. Uh, and uh, ZDF just here is 8 billion euros. Okay, and then you add NHK and BBC and NBC and Sky. And when you look at how much is spent on production around the world, we are such a tiny fraction of the global entertainment market. So to answer your question, uh, when you feel successful, then you reframe the lens in which you compete so that you're always the underdog. I'm always thinking in the uh, scheme of history how small our efforts are. And I try to read a lot of history, and I think that keeps me grounded. Even though we try really hard, we're passionate about what we do, that in the long term we're making you know, still very incremental contributions.